even though I was making more money, it was still the same old thing of um, kind of getting told what to do. Um, and I just, I, I just, it was something in me that, you know, said. Welcome to Occupation Insights, where we discuss jobs and career opportunities. Hi, Tani. It's nice to have you at our podcast, Occupation Insights. Tani Gugino is the owner of Eight District Distillery Company. He has over 18 years of experience as a bartender and has recently opened his own distilling company. Tani is also the winner of the TV show and contest Moonshiners, Master Distiller. Thank you, Tani, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. How are you doing today? Where are you I, located now, by the way? Uh, I am in Manchester, Connecticut. Um, I'm doing great today. The sun is out for second day in a row. I haven't seen it for a while, so it's nice to have that out. <laughs> it's uh, it's a bit gloomy here in Canada, so it's good to hear that sun is somewhere. Um, you know, when we learned about you and when we came across the show Moonshiners, I thought it would be really interesting to have you on this podcast because, you know, what you do and who you are, that is something that many people might be interested about and not many people are doing. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the career I'm in right now, uh, the distilling career I'm in, I've been doing that for about uh, seven years professionally. Um, prior to this, I was a bartender uh, for years, kind of went to the school of hard knocks, as you could say, um, worked behind the bar, fell in love with spirits, um, fell in love with crafting them differently um, for each guest I had. And the big kind of kicker to get into all this was my brother uh, got married about 10 years ago and I made a batch of five gallons of limoncello for him uh, to give out his party gifts for everybody. And as soon as that kind of hit, you know, I was like, man, I really want to get into the production side of things of distilling because behind the bar, I was able to craft uh, my relationships with my guests for me being there. Um, you know, I was kind of the facilitator of those relationships and I just want to be able to extend that into people's homes now um, and be able to put those good times in a bottle and send them on their way. And, you know, hopefully they share a drink for a job well done or a job promotion, you know, something great happened in the family or whatever, you know, celebrating over a bottle of eighth district is what I hope to uh, have people do. That sounds very interesting. And um, we will dive more into it, but you said you went to school for something else. What did you want to study? Originally, I had gone to school for nursing. Um, I, I have an associate's in health science. And oddly enough, the, you know, I kind of live on the philosophy of everything happens for a reason. And um, at the time I was in uh, school, I had applied for nursing school. And the way to get into nursing school was a point standing. So uh, you got points for how many classes you took at the school. Um, you know, what other classes, your grades in your classes and this and that. So even though I scored higher on my entrance exam for the nursing program, I didn't get accepted because I didn't take as many classes at the school. Um, so it was, was not, I'm not going to lie, I was disheartened at first. Um, but, you know, put my head down and said, maybe that's just not meant to be for me. And I kept pursuing my distilling career and kind of took it head on. And couldn't be happier that I did. Um, you know, I'm glad I went to school. I'm glad I got that that base of knowledge of, you know, doing work that you don't necessarily want to do. Um, but very happy in the day that I chose uh, this career path. How did your family react to such a change of heart, you know, going from nursing into distilling? Um, you know, I, I have to say my wife has been my biggest supporter in my life. And she could kind of see it too, um, where I'm much happier being kind of a creative soul, uh, creative spirit. And in nursing, I would have had that bedside manner that I got to keep with bartending. But, um, you know, you can't really be creative when you're a nurse. You got to kind of follow the rules and whatnot. So she was, you know, we sat down and we talked about it. And we just realized that, you know, I can support us financially um, while I'm bartending and and doing my distilling and seeking more. And she was in school at the time too. So she is a full-time nurse in, in the ICU. So we were both in school learning it all. And uh, a big thing for me is passion and just find, and following your passion. 
um, you know, because passion really can radiate through you and into other people. And so no matter what field you go into, just make sure you're passionate about it. Um, and that was the big thing that I, I learned at that kind of crossroad was, sure, I could make a lot of more money quicker in nursing. Um, but at the end of the day, is that really what I wanted to do? Um, so that's a good listen, message. Yes. Yeah. Listen to my heart and found my passion and I'm cruising with it now. <laughs> what I think um, the biggest question here is what was the trigger? What was the biggest motivator for you to switch from bartending to sort of going into your own business? Um, hmm. I guess so. I was a production distiller for another distillery for years. Um, and I have, you know, sometimes too many ideas. Um, and I noticed them kind of just getting the why all the time of like, well, why are we doing this? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do this? No, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to do this. You know, you need to make this taste this way, or you need to make it taste that way. So I lost my, my creativity in a sense. And that's where, you know, in the new year, um, I decided to take a, a different job um, as head distiller and COO of a company on uh, Long Island mm -hmm. and quickly learned as well that even though I was making more money, it was still the same old thing of um, kind of getting told what to do. Um, and I just I, I just it was something in me that, you know, said, especially after the TV show and winning my TV show, that gave me the um confidence to say you know what just do this yourself you know why wait why go get another job and and wait until you have x amount of dollars in the bank to invest into this like think from from struggle and hard work comes you know great accomplishments and that's what we're going through right now you know i'm, I'm funding this all myself um i'm a very novice entrepreneur as far as business goes but i'm learning it and i'm doing it and I'm getting closer every single day. So, you know, this hard, the past couple of months have been tough as a family, you know, just monetarily, of course, um, and just time wise, you know, a lot of what I've been doing, there's not much to show for it in a sense, because it's applying for permits and talking to town officials and whatnot. Um, so it's been tough to, not tough, but just challenging to continue one step in front of the other every single day. Um, but we're here and we're going through it and I can't wait to be on the other side. So it sounds like it is indeed challenging to collect all the documents and permits needed. Um, how do you describe the industry of distilling distillery industry in Connecticut in your state or maybe Long Island where you worked as well? So uh, craft distilling, I've always said is about, you know, 10 to 50, Josie. Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> uh, about 10 to 15 years behind craft uh, brewing. Mm -hmm. So it's a harder market to get into, especially on the craft side of things. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of people will see this industry as, you know, oh, it only cost me, let's say, $10 for a bottle of liquor and I can sell it for 75 But what they don't see behind that is the amount of, of work that takes to get to get it going, you know. Um, but it is booming. It is getting there. I do see a little bit of a resurgence in Connecticut with going towards local um, and, you know, realizing that these big companies who are supplied all around the nation and the world, they're going to make their dollar no matter what. So why not start diving in a little bit more local and, you know, supporting a family in, in your state and in your town. So with that all happening and more and more popping up, it gave me a lot more confidence to, to pursue this. Cause back in the day, you know, distilleries couldn't have a tasting room. We couldn't let people try our spirits. We had to just sell them on the bottle verbally and hope they'd buy it. Um, laws have changed now where we can, we can offer tastings in our, um, in our dia, in our permitted areas. And we can apply for a second license called the craft cafe where we can serve cocktails, Connecticut made beer and wine. So, it really has changed the game for the small producers getting into it all. Um, you know, the feds are starting to realize it too. They made a tax threshold for under 50,000 proof gallons. Uh, you have a, a, a lesser tax um, payment to them. So you're just saving about $11 a gallon. 
as opposed to what you'd pay before. So it just makes it a lot easier to get into it and, and say, I can be like craft beer and open up a smaller spot and, and still make money for my family and enjoy it. For sure. Um, for somebody who doesn't know, what is the difference between brewery and distillery? Uh, so brewing, so there's different types of manufacturing permits. Um, it typically is for wine, brewing and distilling, and they're all separate. So wine, of course, is you're taking grapes, you're crushing them down, fermenting them and selling your product. Uh, beer, you will mash in your beer, you will ferment it, and you will bottle that ferment into the can or bottle or keg. Um, and distilling takes it just a little bit step further. So we do everything that wineries and breweries do, uh, where we ferment our product. And then that's not our end sale. We then take it, put it in our still, um, distill it off and collect just the ethanol off the end of that. And we ditch the rest. Um, and from there, we either put it into a barrel, uh, flavor it off with some other odd flavors, whatever you want to do. Um, and then sell it off that way. So it just takes a little bit more of a process than the, than the rest of the uh, manufacturing of uh, alcoholic spirits does. How many people does it take to do something like that? How many people work for a company? So I've, uh, you know, it can be, it all depends on how, how big you want to be. So uh, for instance, with me and my company, I am the only employee. I am the head janitor, you know, head distiller, bartender, salesman, tax man, HR, general, everything. So it's possible to do it yourself. Um, I've kind of, I'm lucky where I've had year, years prior. So I kind of know what to expect and how I'd be able to get it going. Um, but again, I have a friend who runs a distillery in Kentucky and he has, oh geez, something like 65 employees. And obviously he's on a much bigger scale than I am. He's putting away about 30 barrels a day into his Rick house to age off. So it's all a matter of how you want to scale it. If you want to be hyper local and you want to own your town and own your state, you know, you can do it yourself. You just have to be willing to work, put in the hours and no, it's not, you know, every hour you put in isn't necessarily going to equate to an hourly pay as a W2, but you have a lot more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just a lot more say in it all and do what you want to do. And then, of course, if you want to be bigger and take a 10,000 square foot warehouse and get a 500 gallon still and a thousand gallon fermentation tanks, you know, you can have five employees and get it done with that. It's just, you know, making sure your business plan numbers make sense and and achieving it that way. You know, it's that's what the beauty about this industry is. There's not really a set uh, standard for anything. You know, and it, it, it's almost a blessing and a, and a curse at the same time, because um, a little bit more into the federal side or the permitting side of things, you know, your town fire marshal is the one who can make or break your industry uh, due to the fact there's no regulations for distilleries as a whole. Um, it's kind of up to their interpretation of your fire code and, and what you'll end up being. So, you know, they could make you do a three hour firewall between your building or some of them just say you're good to go you know what you're doing so key definitely with if you do want to get into this industry is just be friendly with your town um you know be honest with them tell them what you want to do and how you want to do it and how you're going to stay safe um and i've i've noticed that in doing that i've gotten a uh, i've gotten very far with the town and, and them almost helping me and guide me into what i need to do rather than walking in and getting into a big cluster initially you said that besides the you know a big amount of documents it also costs uh that can make it challenging for one to open a distillery if you don't mind me asking at what amount are we looking at you know so, how much does it take yeah so it's it's also so uh just another point on that it's also with distilling you know there's brown spirits and there's clear spirits so of course if you're going to be a bourbon distillery you're looking at potentially your first three years of, of no income coming in. You are solely spending all your money and filling barrels. Um, if you're a gin producer, you know, you can have gin outside the door and the next day outside your permit. So again, it's a waving scale, but for me, um, you know, it's kind of give an example. I'm, I'm 
I put a hundred thousand dollars into this project. Um, I started, you know, you need to have your lease in place before you can even start applying for your permits. Um, so I got my lease back in July. Um, I had to do a PNZ, a planning and zoning meeting with the town to uh, allow distilling in town because it wasn't in our regs to allow it. So I got that done. And then it was the federal government and then the town and now the state um, getting there. So a big chunk of your initial investment is your is your lease and your equipment in the beginning. And knowing that, you know, it's not getting in, turning the keys and being able to operate. It's it's you got to wait a little while because another kind of different thing about distilling and brewing is distilling is federally illegal across the 50 states. So unlike beer and wine, you can't make it at home to test your recipes or have friends try it or this or that. You know, you have to be in a uh, bonded and permitted warehouse. So alongside that, too, if you don't have prior experience in the industry, you could spend upwards of a year, you know, getting your products down. So if you're, if you're, if you're newer in the industry, it's definitely going to take a bit more money. Um, I definitely recommend if someone's novice in the industry and wanting to get into it, um, highly recommend the consultant. Um, there's a lot of distilling consultants. I do offer consulting on my side of things too. Um, just because it's, they know what needs to get done and it can save you if not a lot of time, a ton of money. Um, but you got to you got to research your uh, consultant as well, because I've had I hired a consultant on and I was extremely upset with him. He said he had years and years of knowledge and all this everything. And he'll be at my one call all the time. And, you know, it's that's just what it is. I haven't I booked him for 15 hours and I used maybe two and I'm probably never going to use the rest. So business decisions that I've learned growing in this industry and, and growing as a business uh, man and entrepreneur. So, you know, it's just. Do your due diligence, of course, but if it's something you're passionate about, as I've said, passion is a is a is a driver unlike any other. Um, and I've I've had people had friends tell me that where, you know, I'm so passionate about this stuff that I almost I seem crazy, and it's just. It's just what I love. I don't know why. I just do. <laughs> it does seem like your previous background and your passion and creativity was actually the founding stone for what you're doing now. Are there any skills or features or education or certificates that you think I must to have in your industry? Hmm. That's tough. Um I think it's a yes and no answer. Um, I've kind of, I feel as if I've proven myself in this industry with the flavors I can create. And, you know, prior to that with the cocktails I was able to create for people. Um, so I definitely recommend at least some knowledge of spirits, of course, um, and flavors, but there are tons of classes you can take on the industry. Um, for instance, uh, my friend uh, Gary Spedding, he runs the Brewing and Distilling Analytical Services in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I took a gin course with him. And even though I was a producer for six years, going into there, I learned more than I ever thought I could learn about gin. You know, it just expanded it to the next level. So there's tons of books out there um, about distilling. You know, there's this one book called The Alcohol Textbook. It's more so about the ethanol fuel industry but it does correlate down into craft distilling as well. Cause at the end of the day, the big producers who are making bourbon are doing, are under the same laws, same rules, same restrictions as I am as a small distillery. So, you know, just, just research, research, research. And I know actually now that I say this, it just popped in my head. Um, Kentucky being a, a very large part of distilled spirits history, um, they just opened up their first distilling science lab at the University of Kentucky. So they have a permitted facility out there. You can take a full course with them. I believe it's a four year uh, course now um, where you can get your whole distilling science um, background there, which I think is pretty cool. You know, if if it's just if barrel aging and bourbon is something you want to do, get down to Kentucky. I mean, I didn't know such course exist. Yeah. Yeah. So it, 
it started to become a lot more popular. There's, there was only two prior, um, and they were across the pond in Europe. Um, it was, it's Harriet Watt University and uh, IBD, the International Brewing Distilling Sciences, that offer courses. And those are, I mean, those are top, top, top notch courses. Um, you got to do time over there and whatnot. So it's all a matter of, of when you get into it. But of course, the earlier you can define your path, you know, the quicker you can get into it. But as again, I'm 32 years old and I, I'm doing all my stuff now. So it doesn't necessarily mean you can't change ideas and, and move at a later time in life, but use all the information you, you gained, even if it's in a different industry to, to support your industry you're in now. What is the difference between a good distiller and a bad distiller in your opinion? So it's a, uh, a good distiller and bad distiller, of course, number one for me is passion and heart. Um, you know, if if you're not taking care of your fermentation and taking care of your distillation and cleaning your equipment and ensuring a almost like a sterile zone while you're working, you can taste those flavors and spirits. Um, it's almost I almost know too much about spirits now where I can I, I know a little bit more than the average consumer. So I can kind of pick up on those off flavors and whatnot. Um but also just, just being present in your distillation process is, is key. You know, distilling isn't necessarily something that I recommend everybody do at home um, because a lot of times it is an open flame and ethanol and that can go boom. But um, it's just, it, we're, we're chefs at the end of the day, being a distiller, because you know, if I had the same exact equipment with two people, uh, in the same exact place, right next to each other, same mash bill, same everything, we would have two completely distillates coming off the still. Um, so it's really not your equipment, it's the driver of the equipment that, that is key to this industry. You know, it's our noses, it's our mouths, it's our, you know, even our ears in the distillery to sit there and say, that doesn't sound the same as when the still was running last time, what's different this time? Um, and that's it, just being, being part of the process from the beginning to the end. Um, and that's where I love being a craft producer because I'm able to be there from the beginning to the end of the whole process. Um, unlike these bigger places, not saying they don't make good product or anything. It's just, it's totally different for them. It's all automated. They have staff going here and there. So they got to check up on them and whatnot. So if you have staff, you got to have good staff. Um, make sure they're not afraid to tell you when they did something wrong or asking questions or challenging, you know, even what you said to them, because I've learned from, you know, when I was in the TV show, I learned from guys who are doing it in the backwoods. I was like, Oh, wow. You know, always taking in, always learning and growing in your industry. You know, I know a lot, but I don't know everything. And the day I stop learning is the day I stop breathing. So that's what I always say. If you could go back in time, five, 10 years ago, what are some mistakes that you wish you could avoid or you wish you did something differently? Ooh, man. Um, I guess my most recent one I can go back on was uh, chasing money. So mm -hmm. when I, uh, when I won my TV show, you know, it happened before it got aired and everything. And I was like, look at me, I'm Mr. Hotshot. I can do this. And, I had a friend who reached out on Long Island and, you know, asked me to, to join their company and everything. And we talked about it for a bit. I talked to my wife um, and I was going to get, I was getting paid very, very well, you know? Um, and I was commuting four days a week down to Long Island away from my wife and kid. Um, and it was tough, you know, sure. I was, I was making enough money for us to be extremely happy and comfortable and whatnot, but, it was the lack of presence at home that was tough. Um, so, you know how they say everything happens for a reason. Oddly enough, things were going tough down there. I got into a pretty bad accident uh, one day on my way down there. And it kind of changed my thought process and changed my idea of where I want to be. And money doesn't rule the world. You know, of course, it's important. You got to eat. You got to pay to have a roof over your head and insurance and if you're lucky enough to have a car or transportation, but it was a 
great life lesson to say money doesn't rule the world. Um, you know, just make sure you cover yourself and, and you can get there. So that was a great learning experience for me. And, you know, if I could go back five years down the road or even seven years down the road to when I first started, I think I'd kind of do it all the same. I did, you know, I, my first job in a distillery was as a salesman and I didn't get paid for two months. And I said, well, that kind of stinks. But I had this feeling of wanting to be in a distillery because I know I, I saw where craft distilling was going. So I said, you know, put your head down, deal with the dirt and see what else you can do. So luckily enough, I, got morphed into an assistant distiller position and never stopped learning from that point and growing from that point. And it, it, I kind of equate it to um, those who go into the trades, you know, you see these guys who are full-time journeymen who are making, you know, sometimes upwards of a hundred dollars an hour and you walk in there and you're like, I'm going to make this money. And it's like, well, you're only making $16 an hour and you have to work 5,000 hours and do 2000 hours of school. And a lot of people will run away from that. They go, well, the reward isn't there instantly or instantaneously. So I'm going to find something else. But what they don't realize is you have to go through the dirt to be able to get the gold. You know, it's not just sitting on. Sure. Some people do find gold on the surface and kudos to them. You know, like congratulations. Good on you. But that is such a rare thing to have happen that, you know, if you don't put in the hard work and you don't put in the the time to get the respect you, you you need, then it's what's really, why are you really doing it then? For sure. You know how they say that coal under pressure becomes a diamond and that's how it's how it's, um, you mentioned rewards and compensation. And I'm just curious to know, how did that part of the business changed for you when you were a bartender and then you were working for a distillery and now you're the owner yourself? How was your reward changing within that period of time hmm. you know it just I just stayed busy you know I never let I always kept conversations going about stuff you know at when I was an employee I, I pushed the spirit behind the bar that I was making um, but if if someone didn't like it I wasn't going to push them on it and now that I'm an owner it's like well what don't you like about it like, well, what can I change about it? And this and that. So I'm more just, I'm just more hands-on as, as time has gotten on to be able to craft what I want. Because at, at the end of the day, I, I jokingly call myself a liquid artist. You know, uh, my, what you're drinking in a bottle from me is, is my art. You know, that's, it's what I've seen flavors compromise of and, and move towards. So, you know, just, just moving through all the ranks, I guess you could say, um, just taught me more about the industry, you know, cause it was important to be behind a bar to learn how to sell to a guest and how to grow a, a bottle behind a bar um, as opposed to in the market, just saturating the market. So just really for me, the key thing that came to this was, was crafting relationships and cra crafting, you know, friendships and, um, you know, mentors even in this industry is, is a great thing. Cause a lot of, I've noticed people in this industry, they love to talk about it, as you can tell. <laughs> so um, everybody's an open book here and, you know, reach out, reach out to somebody on LinkedIn and just ask them a question. I guarantee you 95% of the people out there will be more than happy to, to sit down for 15 half hour and just chat about the industry and what they see. Having to commute four days a week to Long Island and then having a family at home, what and how did you go to a TV show? Why did you decide to participate in Moonshiners? So that was actually uh, before I ended up taking my job on Long Island. But um, I, so oddly enough, I didn't even plan to go on the show. Um, Magilla Entertainment is the production company that did it. And I've just been active on social media throughout my distilling career and posting stories and reels and videos and pictures and you know occasionally tagging hashtag distilling and, and whatnot and they sent me a message and said hey we love your profile do you want to come on an episode of, of master distiller it's a foraging episode and i was like oh, like i love the outdoors i love this like let's, let's see what happens um and 
they booked me on the show and two weeks later I was flying down to Tennessee. Um, it was, it was really cool. I actually, I almost didn't go on the show to be honest with you. I was so nervous, um, sitting here going, you know, they found me on Instagram because they want, they're pinning me to lose, you know, this young distiller from Connecticut and da 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 da. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and I have a, my daughter's seven years old now, but I had a vision in my head of, of having a conversation with her sitting on the couch in like 10 years from now and having an episode of Master Distiller show up on the TV and going to her like, hey, Ava, you know, like I could have been on that show and her like rolling her eyes going, okay, dad, another one of your things you're saying. And I kind of sat there and said, you know, even if I fail on the show, even if I lose, it's not only a great learning experience for me to say, you did it, you tried, you know, good on you, but a great learning experience for my daughter to say, nerves don't define what you can do and what you can accomplish. It's showing you take this seriously, you know, and, and, and get in it, dive into it. So I, I did, and I'm, I couldn't be happier that I did, you know, and, and jumped into it. And now I got some national exposure. <laughs> Besides the exposure, which definitely is good. And I'm sure you learned a lot of things. Um, how did the show impact your career and your mindset on things? Oh, it, it was, that was the a hundred percent, the catalyst that, that led me to where I am right now. Um, you know, it was, I didn't get much recognition from my last um, employer. And it's not that I need recognition. It's not saying like I needed that, but it was, I made a bunch of recipes for them, uh, about 23 different recipes and didn't get really, didn't, didn't get really any accolades for it all. So people would come in and my, my boss would say, I made this. And he was not, he was never in the shop. So going on the TV show and foraging all my own, own ingredients from Connecticut, you know, making a Coosa dogwood berry jam, I for I made sea salt from Long Island Sound and doing all this, going down there, how I wanted to do it and having these judges and the production crew and just my other contestants on the show who were all there trying my stuff and just being like, wow, 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 wow. And then asking me questions about the distilling process and asking me how I got these flavors and this and that. I, I kind of realized like, holy crap, like you do know what you're doing. Like you don't need a gold medal from the American Distilling Institute to say, you know what you're doing. You don't need this. Like public perception really helped me in this aspect. And of course, getting on the show and talking to these moonshiners and these backwoods boys and these legal guys about just all the different processes and whatnot. And them now a year and a half later, still asking me questions and, and, and whatnot. It just, gave me confidence, you know, and especially when they tried my spirit and were like, this is something we've never tried before. You know, this is bringing foraging to a whole new level, they said, and whatnot. I was like, just do the damn thing. Just do it. You know what? I would rather lose a hundred thousand dollars trying to achieve my dream. than, again, sitting here in 10 years, telling my daughter, I could open a distillery. I could have done this and her going, Oh, Hey dad, another one of your stories. But, um, you know, it just, it gave me confidence and, and that was the key. Um, however you can find it, however you can get it through friends, families, awards, you know, podcasts, talking with people that was, a, that's been a huge driver in all this for me is just people being supportive and, you know, saying, can't wait for you to open. And so talking about the future, five, 10 years from now, how do you see your career just moving forward? What is there for you in the future? So, you know, I'm hoping, obviously the big goals for this business are to eventually branch off into a, uh, have a farm. So um, my wife and I have always wanted to own farmland, have farm animals and, and some crops and whatnot. So I want to be able to have a farm where I grow heirloom corn, start a native apple orchard, mm. grow my botanicals so I can use those in my distillation process, um, you know, start hiring on some employees. And, um, you know, this small space I have right now, it's about a thousand square feet. So it's a super tiny spot, but it, it just 
it feels so homey to me right now. So I never want to lose this spot. I, I hope this stays as my, um, you know, like fun test zone or even a, um, a class that I can offer to people who want to learn distilling, say, come down to Connecticut for a week and you're going to learn everything the ins and outs of the whole nine yards. But, you know, I eventually want to have a, a bigger production facility, start blasting my products out there, get them nationwide um, and see what happens. You know, I, there's not much true bourbon distilling in New England and I'd love to be a forefront of that, start that, get that going. But, you know, it's, and, or even if in five years, if I have my same spot and the same thousand square feet and I'm just making money, then that's, that's fine with me too. You know, it's all just about remaining liquid, as I always say. So it's funny, my, my, LL, my parent company, LLC, I own is called LIQD, Liquid LLC. Um, and that's kind of about the whole thing about my life and business is remaining liquid in, in your business and in your life. You know, I had probably 35 different ideas of where this business was going to go, but writing them down in a business plan each time really helped me define where I'm going with it now. So I wasn't frustrated that, Oh, my idea of wanting to do, you know, a hundred percent rye whiskey wasn't happening right now. I said, all right, table that for the next three months and let's focus on what we can get out right away. And, excuse me, and, and have products flowing like that. So just being liquid and, and saying, if it's working for me, let's keep it going. Maybe take part in more shows and more filmings and commercials. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, hopefully that'd be great. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if Discovery is offering um, the show anymore. I'm not sure what the deal is with that, but if they don't offer it anymore, maybe I'll work with a, a production company myself and offer it here in Connecticut, you know, because it would, it was a great thing for this industry. This industry um, isn't as big as brewing and, and wine is, especially with the smaller craft producers. So this show has opened my eyes to, you know, dozens of, of craft distillers around the nation who I now am friends with and acquaintances with. So to be able to, if I can offer that down the road to other young distillers and novice distillers and people who just want to learn and get into the industry, man, that would be such an honor for me because my my mentor tom anderson over at pickney ben distilling in uh in minnesota he or sorry missouri he um you know he he he's so proud of me and what i'm doing and it just it, it feels like my dad just like supporting me on all this kind of stuff of course my dad is supporting me but he's not in this industry so it's nice to kind of have that mentor in the industry of like you got it you're doing it like i can't wait to see what you create so if I can offer that down the road to somebody else, I would, that would be amazing. As a consultant, as an expert, as an ex-bartender, just all this knowledge accumulatively, what would be some advice that you could give to people that are just looking into going into industry or maybe they just started? Get, get a couple magazines. Um, you know, check out the news headlines of, of where the market's going and um, what you kind of see, what you kind of see happening. If you want to go on a national scale, that is, you know, um, but for me being I, I, I'm starting off so hyper local where, you know, just get out and talk to business owners, talk to your town, talk to the people and see if there's a need for it where you are, because, you know, if you. If you're if you have a passion to open it and you want to do this and you want to get it going, that's you need that for sure. But at the end of the day, we're not making products for ourselves. We're making products for you guys. So being able to have the public into your process and, and kind of taking their advice and whatnot is is, is essential too. Um, but again, it's just hop on LinkedIn and and see you know, follow a bunch of people in the industry and just see what they're posting about. There's tons of people who post journal reviews and analytics or analytical articles and forecasts and the hot new thing and whatnot. And it just, you know, just fulfill yourself with as much information as you possibly can. Absolutely. Thank you, Tony, for joining our podcast. It was really interesting to know more and to learn more about the distillery industry. I think there are plenty of questions left, but we have very little time left. 
um, maybe for a different episode. Yeah, but absolutely. again, more than happy. And if anybody has any questions, they can feel free to find me on LinkedIn, find my email or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm an open book and be more than happy to talk to anybody interested in getting into this industry. Thank you again for your time. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. We are always looking for guests of various backgrounds for our next episode. If you would like to be a guest, please email us at occupationinsightstv, one word, at gmail.com.